Hello, good morning, folks. Uh, good morning to all our friends from the West Coast and our friends and Credo members who are watching nationwide. I want to welcome all my colleagues who are joining us today here in our San Francisco headquarters at Credo. And I want to also welcome all Credo members who are joining us today via our Facebook live stream. We are so honored today to, uh, to have here be joined us by the most popular senator in America. <laughs> Seriously, I, I am... No, I am not making this up. This is, according to hard data, number of recent polls shows that Senator Bernie Sanders from Vermont is indeed the most popular American senator today, today in the country with an astounding 85% approval rating in his home state. Now, that kind of popularity that comes from his constituents, the progressive movement from the entire country, well, frankly, across the globe, I hear he's very popular in Europe and the UK, <laughs> uh, it only happens when a progressive champion relentlessly, fearlessly, tenaciously is always fighting and pushing progressive agenda in his home state, in the halls of Congress, and all over the country. Now, Senator Bernie Sanders is here today to talk about a topic that is the number one topic in the country. It's about health care. This is, this is an issue Senator Sanders has been fighting for decades. Most recently, Sorry. most recently, most recently, he was leading the fight with his colleagues in the Senate to fight back against the relentless attacks by the Republicans on our health care. Just earlier this summer, Senator Sanders was instrumental in stopping the Republicans on their tracks when they tried to jam through Trump care in the Senate. Not only he made speeches on the floor, he barnstormed all over the country, not just in coastal states, but also in uh, red states, in purple states, places like Nebraska, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, uh, Ohio, rallying constituents, rallying progressive activists, and telling them the truth about what Republicans are doing. And he was successful then, we were all successful then, and today, sadly, we are, re we are fully re-engaged in that fight again. As, as many of you know, Senate Republicans are trying to uh, take another go at Trump Care. They're trying to jam through Trump Care 5.0 uh, through the Senate uh, before September 30th. And here, here he is on the front lines again with all his colleagues in the Senate and all of us here trying to fight back against another assault on Trump Care, another assault on uh, the Affordable Care Act. Now, Senator Sanders knows how to play defense, but he also can play offense. And he's also here to talk about how we go on offense on health care. And he's going to talk about an issue Credo members and this entire organization has been fighting for year, year, years. Health care for all. Uh, Senator Sanders recently introduced a Medicare for all legislation in the Senate. It is one of the most comprehensive single-payer Medicare for, Medicare for All legislation a U.S. politician has endorsed. And it is so substantive, it, one third of the Democratic caucus, including some of its brightest stars, like Senator, uh, uh, Senator, Senator Elizabeth Warren, Senator Kamala Harris, Senator Kirsten uh, Gillibrand, have all introduced. So I'm sure many of you will have questions and you're anxious to hear from Senator uh, Senator Sanders on how we fight back against Trump care and how we go up into Medicare for all. So without further delay, here is Senator Bernie Sanders. Thank you. Well, it, it is a pleasure to return here to Credo here in San Francisco. I was here a couple of years ago. We had a great town meeting and it's nice to be back. And I want to congratulate Credo. Uh, you guys are doing exactly what has to be done, and that is you're trying to rally the grassroots of this country to stand up and to fight back against a Congress which increasingly represents the 1% against the bottom 99%. And I want to give you some good news, and I'll give you the bad news and the good news. But the good news is, and I want everybody to understand this, 
that on virtually every major issue that you care about, that I care about, the American people are on our side. And we have already had some enormous successes. And we'll get to health care in a second, where we're also seeing some really positive breakthroughs. If we were here five years ago talking about raising the minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour, you all would have said that we're crazy. That's too high. You can't double the federal minimum wage. All over this country now, because of the work of Credo, grassroots organizations, the AFL-CIO, the trade union movement, Good Jobs Nation, all over this country now, communities are passing $15 an hour minimum wage. Congratulations. We have made real progress in that area. If five years ago, somebody would have suggest that a Medicare for all single payer system would now have majority support in the United States of America in poll after poll. Poll just came out the other day by a very large majority. The American people understand there is something wrong when this nation is the only major country on earth not to guarantee health care to all people is a right. Something a little bit crazy about us spending twice as much per capita on health care as any other people. A little bit absurd that we are paying by far the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. We have made huge progress. And as you've heard, we now have 16 co-sponsors on a Medicare for all single payer program. We're making huge progress in that area as well. So the good news is, is that on many issues, we are bringing the American people together in a progressive way. But obviously there is some very, very bad news out there. And it seems to me what our politics has got to be about at this pivotal moment in American history is to fight back against Trump's reactionary agenda on one hand, whether it is throwing 800,000 young people off of the legal status they have now by ending the DACA program. We've got to stand up and fight back against that. And obviously, and we're here today to say, no, we're not going to see 32 million Americans thrown off of the health insurance they have, we're going to defeat any effort to dismember the Affordable Care Act. We're going to stand up to Trump's disastrous ideas, or lack of ideas, on climate change, and make it clear to every person in this country, and I gather you had a 106 degree temperature here in San Francisco the other day, maybe people here are waking up too, that climate change is real, and we're seeing the manifestations of that. Here on the West Coast, we're seeing it all over this country, in Florida and Texas, we're seeing it all over the world. And we are going to stop Trump's disastrous ideas about supporting the fossil fuel industry. We're going to transform our energy system away from fossil fuel to energy efficiency and sustainable energy. More and more people are on board that effort as well. So the good news is that as a result of the work of a lot of people, the American people are coming together around a progressive agenda. And obviously, the very bad news is the guy who sits in the White House right now. Uh, and we have got to fight him every step of the way. But we have also always got to counter. It's not good enough, in my view, to say Trump is wrong on this. Trump is wrong on tax breaks for the rich. Trump is wrong on health care. Trump is wrong on climate change. We need an agenda that speaks to working families today who are hurting. They don't want to hear about how bad Trump is. They want your ideas about how we improve life in this country. They want your ideas as to how in the wealthiest country in the history of the world we're going to make sure their kids can afford to go to college. They're going to have health care for their children and their parents. So one hand, we fight back against Trump's agenda. On the other hand, we go forward with a progressive agenda. And right now, in terms of that paradigm, that's where we are right now. The immediate task is to defeat this horrific so-called Graham Cassidy legislation which is coming up we think in the Senate uh, this week next week and they have by arcane Senate laws which I won't bore you with uh, they have to get this thing passed by September 30th or else they'll need 60 votes to do it clearly they're not going to get 60 votes so their only hope is to get 50 votes in their past absurd health care proposals and we beat back three of them, they've had up to 49 votes. If they get one more vote, 50 votes, then the vice president breaks the tie and obviously voting with the Republicans. So they are 
somewhere now at 47, 48, 49 votes. We've got to keep them from getting that 50th vote. And that's going to happen uh, within the next uh, week or two. Now, what is this Graham-Cassidy bill about? It's more or less the same old, same old of what we've been hearing about over the last couple of months, maybe a little bit worse. It's disguised under the uh, rubric of um, federalism, decentralization, but it's the same old, same old. What it ends up doing at the end of 10 years, over a 10-year period, is to throw 32 million Americans off of the health insurance they currently have. And frankly, one of the difficulties we have in this debate is the Republicans' proposals are so horrific People don't even believe you. They think, oh, you're being political. They're really not going to throw people who have cancer, who have heart disease, who have asthma off of the health insurance. My God, they're not going to do that. Why are you exaggerating? I am not exaggerating. That is exactly what they are going to do. So to anybody who's watching this, who is struggling now with a life-threatening disease, who obviously is staying alive because of the health insurance and the medical care they're getting, worry and worry a whole lot. I'll never forget we did a town hall, a, a um, teleconference town hall uh, in Vermont a couple of months ago, and a woman called me up uh, and from Vermont, and she said, my son has a very, very serious illness, and we're spending a zillion dollars a, a year on prescription drugs. He's on Medicaid right now. What happens if the proposal goes through? I didn't have the decent, I didn't have the courage to tell her the truth, and that truth that is likely her son will die, that he will not be able to get the medicine that he needs. And that is the reality. Now, this is not Bernie Sanders talking. Study after study says what is obvious. If you are, have a life-threatening disease and your health insurance is cut, what do you think is going to happen to you if you're in cancer treatment today, if you have a serious heart disease and you have no health insurance? You know what's going to happen? You're going to die. Now, they don't like talking about that. I get criticized for talking about it. But study after study from doctors, researchers, indicates what is obviously the case. Thousands of people will die. We don't know how many but thousands of people every single year will die if this type of legislation goes through. Okay. On top of that, you got two and a half million women today who are getting the health care they want, good quality health care, at Planned Parenthood. They're going to defund Planned Parenthood. Now, these are the guys who tell you that they believe in freedom of choice. Remember that? Get government off of our backs. Let people do what they want to do with their lives. Two and a half million women want Planned Parenthood is their choice of where they get their health care. Gone. You're an older worker in San Francisco or Vermont. You're living on, you're making $40,000 a year, $50,000 a year. You're 62 years of age. According to the AARP, your health care premiums are going to soar, soar. And many of those older workers will not be able to. To afford the health insurance that they need. So what you have is a disastrous proposal opposed by virtually every national health care organization. The AMA is not, the American Medical Association is not known to be one of the radical progressive groups in America. They are vigorously opposed to this for all the right reasons. These are doctors. They're not going to be able to practice health care effectively if their patients don't have any insurance. The American Hospital Association is opposed to it because this will decimate rural hospitals all over this country. When Medicaid is severely cut, these hospitals are not going to survive, which means in communities all over this country, people are not going to have their local hospital uh, anymore. So this bill, which is opposed by almost every national health care organization, is a total disaster. But I do have to tell you, I do have to be honest and acknowledge there are some people who are supporting this legislation. Uh, and there was a very interesting article the other day which said that Republican billionaire campaign contributors have made it very clear to the Republican leadership that unless this bill is passed, they're going to start cutting the spigot for Republican <laughs> candidates. What is this all about? This is not a health care bill. You don't throw 32 million people off of health insurance and talk about health care reform. Nothing to do with health care reform. This is cutting federal spending so that we can expand military spending so that we can give many, many trillions of dollars in tax breaks to the top 1%. This is the Koch brothers' agenda. So don't look at this as health care reform. We can have a debate 
All right, good debate. How do we provide health care to all people in the best possible way? Man, that is a real good debate that nobody has all the answers to. This is not that. Nobody thinks that health care reform, improving health care, consists of throwing 32 million people off of health insurance, cutting Medicaid by $700 billion so the children with disabilities now will be shut off from the health care that they receive. So we got a lot of work on our hands. We got a very short time to do it. And I would urge every person watching this program, every person in this room, to get on the phones, get on your computers, start sending out the emails, rally people all over this country, and let the Republicans understand that if they go forward with this disastrous, horrific piece of legislation, they will pay a political price for which they will never recover. So that's that. Thank, thank you. Well, great. We'll, we'll have some questions. Senator, I will start with the first question, and I think you have laid out why you're so concerned about this latest attempt for them to uh, ram through Trump Care. I think it's their fifth, amount, uh, fifth attempt, right. Trump Care 5.0. Uh, one of the questions that we're getting is, hey, you know, we have done this four times already. Like, how, how concerned should we be this time again? Like, are they going to have the votes? Do we, uh, we pretty much gave it all the last the first four times. All right, but we did give it all. And I want to say the results of us fighting back has not just been that we defeated this thing on four occasions. Mm -hmm. Equally important is the American people now know because of your work how awful this mm -hmm. proposal is. You know what the polls show? Polls show that 20% of the people support this, 16% of the people support this. Overwhelming opposition. The Republicans used to have town meetings where 50 people showed up to talk about how they can give tax breaks to billionaires. Now 1,000 people show up and say, you know what, you're not going to kill my wife by throwing her off the health insurance he now has. So we have changed that debate. But like in many other respects, what we are up against is a billionaire class which represents very few people but which has enormous amounts of money. All right? So all of you get one vote. But the Koch brothers get a vote, and they get the opportunity to spend $300 million in the coming year making sure that these guys get reelected. That's what we are up against. We're up against a corrupt political system. If there was a vote tomorrow about this bill among the American people, Republicans would be laughed out of the room. It is so absurd. But we are taking on very powerful people. So it's not good enough to say, gee, we tried, we worked hard. We've got to do it again. We've got to do it in the next week, the next two weeks. Because we are talking about life and death. And I'm not being figurative here. I'm being very little, literal. For thousands of people in this country. So if you're tired, it doesn't matter. Because there are children now with life-threatening illnesses who will die if we don't defeat this proposal. So let's get on the phones. Let our Republican, my Republican colleagues hear from you. And let's do everything that we can to make sure this does not become law. We're going we're gonna to try to take some questions from the, uh, from the audience. So let's see. Oh, I see Nicole's hands up there. Uh, Nicole? Hi, Senator Sanders. My name is Nicole. I'm a campaigner here at Credo. And my question is, um, how is the new Graham-Caskey bill either just as bad as the other Trump care bills, or is it worse? Well, this is what it is. It becomes a little bit... What they will focus on is the fact that they're going to end federal control over health care. They're going to end Medicaid as we now know it and give options back to the states. Isn't that a wonderful thing? California is different than Texas. Let's give control back to the states. Well, a couple of factors that they are not discussing in that logic, and that is they are substantially cutting funding, and they're doing away with the basic benefit package, the fundamental benefit package that has been established in the Affordable Care Act. For example, pre-existing conditions. We work so hard to end the obscenity of insurance companies not being able to provide insurance to people who had pre-existing conditions. That's gone. All right. Women's rights to maternity care, gone. So the basic health care benefits that we fought for in the Affordable Care Act that should protect 
every single American that is gone. That's the fundamental difference. Thank you. Senator, now we have a question uh, from <coughs> one of our uh, team members in Denver. Keto actually has a presence in Denver, a, a purple state where we have a Democratic senator and a Republican senator who often tries to bill himself as a moderate Republican. So it's a question from Kylie, who actually will be also delivering petitions to Senator Gardner's office in the next 40 minutes about Trump care, uh, to asking him to uh, resist Trump care. His question is, question is, there are a number of so-called moderate Republican senators who are currently on the fence. You know, they, they haven't seen the bill, but they're telling people they're trying to read it. Uh, but supporting Graham Cassidy. What would you say to them if they were sitting right across you right now? Well, there are many states in this country, all states are going to be losing funding, especially the states that have expanded Medicaid, because that will be done away with. And what I would say to so-called, I don't use that word, moderate Republicans, I don't know what exactly that means. <laughs> <laughs> but this is... Where we are right now in terms of health care is the Affordable Care Act has done a lot of good things that I think you're all aware of. It's expanded health care to 20 million more Americans, done away with obscenities like pre-existing conditions. Um, but problems remain. So I think short term, what I would say to Republicans is do what the American people want. Right now, given the fact that Republicans control the House, the Senate, and the White House, let's do our best to improve the affordable care. What does that mean? Lower the cost of prescription drugs. Uh, perhaps provide a public option in every state in this country so people are unhappy with the cost of their private insurance, they can go to a Medicaid type option. Um, lower the age of Medicare, perhaps, from 65 to 55. Those are short-term goals that the American people support and would be a good thing. Longer term, of course, where moderate Republicans won't go, is we need to move to a Medicare for All program. That's what I would say. Okay. You, you almost set up our, our, our next question, and this is, another, uh, this is coming from another colleague of ours from another purple state, Ohio, with a Republican senator and a Democratic senator. This is from Josh from Cincinnati. So as you are out um, fighting back against Trump care and also building support for Medicare for all, does it, so it sounds like you may be open to the idea, it's like Medicaid buy-in, or lowering the Medicare eligibility age? All right, again, two things. We have an immediate crisis, and that is we have got to do everything that we can in the next several weeks to defeat this horrific Republican proposal. Also, what we can do with Republican control is see if there can be a consensus about short-term fixes, and I just gave you my idea mm -hmm. about some of them. Medicare buy-in may be one, public option may be another. There should be consensus about lowering uh, prescription drugs because we pay by far the highest prices uh, in the world. So those are short-term solutions. But again, longer term, I think the answer is going to be uh, a Medicare for all. So I am sympathetic to some short-term fixes uh, after we defeat this uh, Republican proposal. So we'll see, we'll take some more questions from the audience. So, Heidi? Um, hi, Senator Sanders. I'm Heidi. I do women's rights campaigning for the action team. And so I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about how <laughs> Medicare for All will expand abortion access. Well, I don't use that frame. What I simply say, it provides reproductive health to all people in this country. And that includes abortion, of course. All right. You know, I believe, uh, as I suspect most of you, uh, that it is women who should have the right to control their bodies, not the United States government. And again, I believe that it is beyond hypocrisy for the Republican Party to tell us that they want to get government out of our lives, but they're telling you what you can do with your body. And our legislation ends that. Thank you, Senator. So the next question I have is actually from some physician friends of mine. Good. You know, they know Credo works really hard on Medicare for All, and these are folks who are not necessarily political, like political junkies like us, but they, they're paying attention, and they're progressive. They are open to your idea of Medicare for All. So they have told me multiple side, hey, Mershad, you know, if you ever see Senator Sanders in person, would you ask him this, that 
right now, the current Medicare provider reimbursement rates are so low that they often have to offset the cost of treating Medicare patients by upping the number of patients they see with private insurance. And some physicians also, they say, cannot afford to treat Medicare pa patients at all. So their question, I'm at, you know, my question on behalf of them, is how would a system like single payer address this provider pay issue? Well, I think the, the main problem with physician reimbursement rates is with Medicaid more than with Medicare. Uh, Medicaid reimbursement rates are, in fact, too low. And there are many physicians all over this country who are refusing to see Medicaid patients. That's a very, very bad thing. Uh, our reimbursement rates, I think, would be very fair to physicians uh, mm -hmm. all over this country. Got it. Uh, any questions? Oh, there's Michael. Hi, Senator Sanders. Hi, My Michael. My name is uh, Michael. Uh, I'm a data analyst here. And given that the United States spends more than any other country on health care, yeah. why is it that we encounter the problem where we can't guarantee health care access Good. to everybody? Well, great. Uh, in my view, the health care debate, whether it's over Medicare for all or these disastrous Republican proposals, have nothing to do with health care, but they're really political and economic. And that is, um, last year, uh, the pharmaceutical industry the top five drug companies, you know how much money they made in profits last year? $50 billion in profits. And if you look at the compensation packages that the CEOs make, they're very, very high. Wall Street does very well by the current system. Insurance companies doing very well, making a lot of profit. So what we are at is a system which is dysfunctional, a system today which has 28 million with no health insurance, more who are underinsured with high copayments of deductibles, right? But it's a great system if you are a profitable pharmaceutical company or an insurance company. And the reason they will vigorously oppose, so they're all lining up already in opposition, to a Medicare for All program is, number one, we will negotiate, of course, drug prices with the pharmaceutical industry, as every other country on earth does. And number two, we're going to eliminate for basic services private insurance. Now, the reason, why is, why is our health care system so expensive? Our health care system is so expensive for a number of reasons. Number one, we have hundreds of separate insurance programs so that you have a certain deductible. You have a $5,000 deductible. I have an $8,000 deductible. You have a $50 copayment. You have a $30 copayment. Administering this incredibly complicated system costs us hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars a year. It costs 2% to administer the Medicare program, traditional Medicare. It's a simple program. It costs between 12 and 18 percent to administer private insurance programs. So we believe we can save many hundreds of billions of dollars by saying, hey, everybody in America is going to have comprehensive health care. And it will be easier and much less expensive to administer. That's one way. And number two, we negotiate drug prices. We're going to save over $100 billion just bringing drug prices down to what they pay in other countries. Okay. So, Senator, another question we have is, now just going back to Medicare for all, you know, we get the sense that some of your colleagues in the U.S. Senate uh, would probably may support your legislation on substance. You know, they, they, on substance, and, and the majority of Americans actually are supportive of it at all, but for some odd reasons, they are politically very reluctant to support it. Uh, do you think a concept like Medicare for all would take off and be popular in red states and purple states? I, I am not into, let me be very honest with you, uh, I am not much into red states and purple states. Fair <laughs> because I think the issues, and, and I hope all of you appreciate that, we've got to get out of that head. I understand, believe me, that there are differences uh, political differences in the United States on the issue of abortion, for example. The country is divided, frankly. The issue of guns, very strong differences of women. Gay rights, less so, I think. Uh, more and more people understand that we should not be discriminating against people because of their sexual orientation. But there are differences between and I. But on issues like that, why, why would you think that if you went to Kansas and you talked to a mom who can't afford health insurance for her kids, that she's going to be hostile to a Medicare for all because she's from Kansas or from Mississippi? They're not. And we've got to get over that head. On all of these economic issues, my friends, we're in this thing together and we're going to have majority support. 
Now, the reason why some of my colleagues are nervous about this, I understand it. Because the drug companies and the insurance companies are going to lie about their position and what Medicare for All is, and they're going to spend huge amounts of money trying to defeat anybody who comes up and supports Medicare for All. I've had that thrown against me, and here is one of the arguments. Senator X wants to raise your taxes by zillions of dollars nationally, okay? What do they forget to tell when they talk about taxes? That we are eliminating private insurance premium payments. So if I say to you, you know what, I'm going to raise your taxes. I'm going to ask you to pay $3,000 more a year in taxes. But by the way, you're not going to be paying $5,000 a year to Blue Cross Blue Shield or United Health Insurance. How do you feel about that? You feel pretty good because I saved you $2,000 a year. <laughs> but when you see the ads, what the ads are going to tell you is your taxes are going up by $3,000. That's one of the many lies. They're going to tell you that you don't have freedom of choice with regard to the doctor that you want to go to. That's a lie. The truth is that today many of you don't have freedom of choice because your preferred position may not be in the network of your plan. All right? So you're going to see a lot of lies, but it comes back to your question. Understand that these people have unlimited amounts of money. I don't have to tell you here in California. We work on a prescription drug initiative. Remember that? Proposition 61. Do you know how much the drug companies spent to defeat that? $130 million just in one state on one initiative. What do you think they would do with Medicare for all for the whole country? Billions of dollars likely. All right? That's what we're, and that's why people are afraid. For good reason. And then our response to that is we need a massive grassroots movement to take on the drug companies, take on the insurance companies in all states in this country. Well, to be fair, blue, blue is my favorite color. <laughs> <laughs> and we only hope our friends in Kansas and Mississippi enjoy the benefits and also get aligned with the values that we have in well, California. Well, I have been to Kansas. And I have been to Mississippi. And let's, let us not fall into the trap of dividing up this country. Right. People in Kansas are extraordinarily decent and good people. And our job, one of the problems is if you go to many of those states, they don't hear any progressive perspective. Their governments are right-wing. Their media is right-wing. So don't start off with the sense that the people in Kansas or Mississippi or any place else are hostile to our ideas. Bad way to get started. Start off with the assumption, which is true, that most working people are sympathetic to what we are trying to do. And our job is to bring people together around that agenda. Here, here. So speaking of bringing people together, uh, what advice would you have for people who are watching at home uh, over the next two, three days or next week what should they be doing to stop Trump care Good. and how they can build support for Medicare Thank for you, All? Because that's, that's really where we are right now. Um, first of all, uh, then go to my website. There are a lot of other good websites out there. Get the information of exactly how disastrous this bill would be. And get it out to your friends and get it out all over the country. If people in states represented by Republicans get on the phone and start talking to them and say, excuse me, you cannot throw my kid off of health insurance or my mother off of health insurance. That will have an impact. So what we have to do is redouble the efforts that we have been involved in. Credo has done such a very good job on over the last number, a number of months. Get the word out. Flood the phone lines on Capitol Hill. All right. Get the emails out. But do it not only in your own state. If you have friends or you're part of organizations that are national, have them do the same thing. This is it. We're up against the wall. It's going to come down to one or two votes. We can defeat this thing if we rally the American people, and that's what we've got to do. Well, thank you again for Senator Sanders for joining us today. I have a question. Will you come back again and do this? Now, you guys are doing, you know, when I talk about a political revolution, that's what you're doing. Our job is to educate, to organize at the grassroots level. When we turn the grassroots around, the Congress and the leaders will follow. And that's what you're doing. So keep up the great work, and I'd be very happy uh, to come back when I'm here on the West Coast. Thank you all awesome. very much. Awesome.
Great. So I want to thank all of you for joining us today. This was, this was really great. But as Senator Sanders said, he left us with an action item, right, to make, make calls. You can go to his website. And to make it easy for you, this is where Credo can help you. We can help. We're a phone company. We, we can help you make calls, right? And I'll give you a number. I think it will pop up on the screen. 872-244-6501. That's 872-244-6501. That is a very special call tool that we have at Credo that when you dial it, it automatically connects you to all the key Republican senators offices. And not just their office in D.C. Their office is in Juneau, Alaska, Flagstaff, Arizona, Boulder, Colorado, Bangor, Maine. They, they, are, they will want to hear your calls. And so get well, I'm not so sure they really want to hear it. <laughs> make sure that they do hear Make sure they do, right? So, so, uh, so please get on and make the calls. And you can also get more up-to-date information by following us on social media, on Twitter, at Credo Mobile, on Facebook, at Credo. And obviously, you can also go to credoaction.com. So thank you again, everyone, and have a great Friday. Good job. Thank you.